Welcome to the Bogleheads Chapter Series. This episode was hosted by the Minnesota Bogleheads and recorded June 12, 2021. It features Alan Roth and Mel Lindauer. The topic is Framing Financial Decisions and Bogleheads Philosophy. Bogleheads are investors who follow John Bogle's investing philosophy for attaining financial independence. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice. Alan Roth and Mel Window. So, Alan, he's the founder of Wealth Logic. He's been working in the investment world for 25 years of corporate finance. He served as a corporate finance officer of two multi billion dollar companies and consulted with many others. Alan has decades of experience in portfolio construction and performance benchmarking. He's appeared on numerous TV and radio shows, which I can attest to. I, Alan's everywhere, I think. <laughs> you turn on a show and hey, there's Alan. He takes pride in being mocked on a semi-regular basis by some financial professionals for his hourly fee model and his obvious inability to make himself rich, kind of like Jack Bolo. He is also the author of How a Second Grader Beats Wall Street. He writes for the AARP, the Wall Street Journal, and others. He's taught investments and behavioral finance at the University of Denver. Despite many of his credentials, CFP, CPA, MBA, he has earned that he has earned. He claims he can still keep investing simple. His professional goal is to never be confused with Jim Cramer. So that's Alan. And before uh, we move on to Alan's thing, Mel Lindauer, I called him the first Boglehead, the first Vanguard diehard. Why is that? I think we have some questions where we'll dig into that history. For many of you that don't know, Mel was a Marine. He's uh, spent a lot of time in the Marine Corps and he's stationed out of Philadelphia. And that's where he remained after his discharge. At Jack Bogle's request, Mel founded and served on the president as president of the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy from its founding way back in 2010 until his res- resignation in 2019. Mel and his friend and co-author, Taylor Larimore, arranged the first get-together with Jack Bogle and about 20 folks down in Miami in 2000, 21 years ago. That was to be the first of the annual Bogleheads conferences. Uh, Mel also is a co-author of the two best-selling Boglehead books on investing, a former columnist for Forbes.com. He was a moderator and contributor at the original Morningstar Die Hard Forum, and now continues that as a moderator and contributor at the Bogleheads.org uh, forum. Money Magazine honored Mel as one of the money heroes for his work in investor education over the years. Wow. So these two guys, I'm going to shut up here so we can hear from these guys. So, Alan, take it away, please. Great. Thank you. Uh... Can you see the slide? Can you guys see the slide? Yeah, we sure can, Alan, looks great. Okay, good, okay, terrific. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And you know, to all of you out there, you do so much on the Bogleheads Forum to help so many people everywhere. And uh, you know, that's a wonderful thing. Um, so, you know, as a licensed financial planner, I, I've got to give a couple of um, disclosures, legal disclosures. Number one, I despise coming after Mike Piper. The guy is so darn good and gives away all of his brilliance, you know, without any incentive to, to make profit. It makes me look very bad. He used to live out here. I so uh, miss him. And Mel, way to go, because I think you're the guy that discovered him and brought him into the um, Bogleheads. Uh, second of all, as a licensed financial planner, I can exaggerate. So I owe my life to Jeff, who saved my life about a dozen years ago when I wrote a column uh, for Money Magazine called The Mole. It was kind of the hidden secrets. It was an anonymous column um, of the hidden secrets of, uh, of the financial services industry. And um, I made a post that allowed people to track who I was and Jeff protected my identity from the, uh, from the insurance uh, world. So thank you. A little exaggeration. <laughs> sure. So I'm going to talk, you know, a lot has changed since the mole. You know, expenses have gone way down. There's now more money in U.S. stock index funds than active funds. I mean, Jack Bogle and all of you really have succeeded. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a Mo like, um, still how my industry tends to frame things that may not be good for you. And I'm gonna, two, two of the largest pet peeves that I have now are, are munis and mortgage. I'm gonna start with the mortgage. Um, so number one, asset allocation. And here's an example. Let's say we have a person that has a half a million dollars in stocks, a half a million dollars in bonds, and a $400,000 house with a $200,000 mortgage. So the common framing, the way my industry would like it to be framed is you have a million dollar portfolio. It's 50% stocks, 50% bonds, and 200,000 home equity. And I say, baloney, this person has an $800,000 portfolio that has uh, 500,000 in stocks and 300,000 in bonds and a $400,000 home. Of course, both have the same net worth. And the reason why is that the mortgage is just the opposite of a bond. When you buy a bond or a bond fund, you're lending money. When you take a mortgage out, you're, you're, you're paying a bank uh, principal and interest. So how you finance a house has no impact on the price you ultimately sell it for. And it turns out that borrowing money at two and a half percent and lending it out at one, one and a quarter percent, it's not a great strategy, especially the new tax law makes it even less great where people aren't getting much, if any, of a tax deduction for, but the fixed income, the bond fund is typically taxable. Um, and, you know, most of my industry wants you to compare that two and a half percent mortgage to the overall return of the portfolio. If you think about it, planners that charge assets under management or commission and banks, of course, they all make money from this. And whenever I write about this, I get lots of nasty emails, you know, and my favorite one was only a baboon would do what I recommended. So I went back to him. I said, you know, here's a deal. Um, you know, I'll lend you money at, uh, uh, or you, you lend me money at 1%, I'll lend it back to you at 2.5%, you can invest it in the market and pocket the difference. So it really is that simple. There's only one reason not to pay off your mortgage if you have high quality fixed income paying less after taxes, and that's because you need it for liquidity to be able to sleep at night. Um, back to a cap-weighted index fund, you know, the argument is, sure, what Jack created was, was great, but there's far more uh, opportunities uh, now. If you buy a cap-weighted index fund, you're guaranteed to underperform the market by the fees. Um, you know, you're just buying more of those overvalued, um, you, you know, large cap growth companies. And look, since 1928, the data is compelling that small cap value has trounced the cap weighted portfolio. That's what many in my industry want you to believe. But a cap weighted index fund must beat the average dollar invested in the market. Uh, it has to happen that way. Bill Sharp's arithmetic of active investing uh, shows that. It's, it's, yeah, it's second grader math. Uh, picking parts of the market or, or weighting differently, it is active investing. And then finally, you know, I love it when I hear data since 1928, et cetera. Well, no one that I know has been investing in small cap value since 1928. And, and by the way, it would have been outrageously expensive. So, um, you know, a lot of this smart beta is, is, is just trying to beat the market. What Jack Bogle created, a cap-weighted index mutual fund, is, is brilliant. Now, when I teach behavioral finance, I ask people to find patterns out of this. And people are pretty good at saying, hey, the right hemisphere is far more filled in. The bottom right is completely filled in. You know, Column C is blank. Column D is all filled in, et cetera. And we're really good at finding patterns. This was just a random number generator where each cell had a 50% chance of being filled in. So, you know, how incredibly unusual would it be to find patterns over 
um, decades and decades with thousands of uh, stocks, et, et cetera. So we now have more than 600 investing factors and all of these worked brilliantly in the past, which would be a great strategy if any of us had a uh, time machine. Mine doesn't work. Um, so the term smart beta are finding some of these factors and it turns out dumb beta wasn't so dumb. You know, about six, seven years ago, I'd be at a conference, smart beta, factor tilting, free lunch, et cetera. And you can see how small cap in value drastically underperformed the market and especially large cap growth. And the total dollar return is, is pretty amazing. It will take years and years and years for small cap value to catch up. Why? You know, things change. If we look at what were the 10 most valuable companies uh, in the United States in 1980 and compare them to 40 years later, it's a different world. And we go back to 1900, the majority of the value of the US stock market was in the railroad industry. So things change and, and finding patterns of what worked in the past is, is, is not the ticket to work going forward. And by the way, in 1981, I went to work for Exxon number three, which later bought Mobile number seven and today isn't in the top 25 combined. Um, and, and then drivers of stock market returns, you know, why does cap market cap indexing work? Um, and if we look at what total stock market did last year, so it's the total return of the, the Vanguard total stock market, including dividend reinvestments, and compare it to the same smart value tilting uh, of the same companies, uh, that smart beta got less than half of the total return. Why? Because every year there's a handful of companies that really drive the return of the total stock market. Last year, it was Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, uh, et, et cetera. And again, if I knew what next year's would be, I would be um, having my own uh, rocket ship company and going into space before uh, um, Jeff Bezos. And, and we have an addiction to prediction. Um, it, it, it's a human trait that we hate randomness. So we all have to get forecasts of what's going to outperform next year. And, and my friend Christine Benz does a great job of getting some of these forecasts together. And all of them, especially when you read the logic, are very, very compelling. And even Vanguard's um, estimate of, of future returns, uh, and, and at least they do it better. They, they give a range and they do it over a 10-year period. So, but if you look at what they are saying, US equity, and you compare it to the uh, international equity two bars above, they're saying international will outperform or is likely to outperform, which, which by the way, I happen to agree with, not by the magnitude they're showing, but where I disagree with is if you look at the bar, you know, the, on, on the left, they're showing it has less downside risk. And again, if I knew how to get a greater return with less downside risk, um, I, I would be a billionaire. And then it's, it's absolutely amazing to me when we look at these predictions that very, very few people go back and look at uh, what their predictions were uh, years earlier. And Jeremy Grantham, he, he, he paints a really compelling picture and it's gonna be pretty ugly for stocks, especially US stocks, but that's exactly what he said about seven years ago. So uh, it, it's very difficult to accept that we don't know. But if you think about it, look at what happened last year. We had a pandemic, we had surging unemployment, we had plunging GDP, we had racial unrest, we had political discourse like I've never seen before and the US stock market gained 21.03%. It really is hard to predict uh, what's going to happen. Uh, interest rates, uh, I'll admit that I don't like interest rates right now, but they've been far worse. You know, the common framing is, is they're an all time low, they have to go up, 
it was once so easy to get income from bonds. Um, and we've got to avoid bonds except for things like the ultra short or floating rates. And there are better alternatives. This is how my industry likes to frame it. The ultra short bond fund, which by the way, Schwab had an ultra short bond fund that completely blew up in 2009 during the financial crisis. Uh, Vanguard has one now that is yielding, I think 0.45% and is in uh, barely investment grade. Uh, high yield bonds, AKA junk or floating rates. You know, all floating rate bonds are junk bonds because guess what? Credit quality companies don't need to issue variable debt. You know, dividend stocks, REITs, I love it. I, I keep hearing this commercial NRIA, a safe 10% uh, return. If it were so safe, don't you think pension plans would uh, pour money in? Why would they be you know, doing a zillion different advertisements uh, for it? So spending a lot of marketing money. Uh, master limited partnerships, most annuities, individual bonds rather than bond funds. Um, and these are things that I think are dangerous. The way I tend to look at bonds and interest rates is, is first of all, they've been far worse. Go back to 1981. And I, I tell clients this, and I said, do you remember when you could earn, if they're this old, a 12% um, return on a CD or a treasury? And they smile. But then I say, think about it. You put $100,000 in, you get $12,000 interest, a third of it went to the state and federal government in taxes. You left with 8,000 or an 8% return. And inflation was about 14%. So you lost 6% of your spending power. Um, the purpose of fixed income has, has never been income. The top economists have called the direction of interest rates correctly, meaning up or down 30% of the time over the last 50 years. So in other words, They've been wrong 70%, even though they had a 50% chance of, of getting it right. Um, and I could explain why that happens. I, I mean, it, it, it's absurd. If we all knew that interest rates were going to go up, then when the Treasury has its auction next week, we would bid less to get a greater return, and rates already would have gone up. Now, there are some better ways to earn more. A lot of 401k, 403b plans, you know, had negotiated contract with insurance companies that they never dreamed rates would be this low, that, that are still paying pretty high. TIAA, you know, on their annuity contract and on a lot of these 403bs, you've got to read all the fine print, but they have a, a minimum guaranteed uh, 3%. Uh, the thrift savings plan, the G fund yielding about one and five eighths. I uh, wish I had direct, I wish I had access to that. Uh, direct CDs can pay more insured savings account. You know, I still have, believe it or not, a savings account that's yielding uh, 1% and NCUA uh, in, in insured versus what Vanguard or Fidelity or any brokerage are paying 0.01%. And, and then finally, like I said, paying down the mortgage because the mortgage is the inverse of a bond. Uh, next, you know, insurance and inertia. Uh, you probably heard the saying, in fact, it was in my book and probably wrong, that Albert Einstein said the power of compounding is the most powerful force in the universe. Uh, Jason Zweig has educated me. We, we don't know for sure, but he probably never would, never said that. So, you know, I call inertia uh, the most powerful force in the universe. So when it comes to insurance, you know, the industry likes to say, protect yourself and your family no matter what. Buy as much insurance as you want. I love this one. If you love your family, you're going to buy permanent insurance rather than temporary term insurance. Because 99% of term policies will never pay out a dime. Um, and of course, you insure your house. Why not insure your portfolio? Variable, annuity, universal life, etc. Um, now I say baloney, you know, number one, insurance companies are for profit, even not for profit insurance companies, mutuals, um, have to make a profit. So you, you insure yourself for only what you cannot afford to lose. 
So as wealth grows, you know, most insurance needs dissipate. I have no insurance on my cars, no, I'm sorry, collision or comprehensive. I have liability and umbrella. Um, and, and then permanent insurance, it's an indirect investment. If you think about it, if you buy a whole life policy from Northwestern Life, look up Northwestern Life, what their balance sheet is in, and you're going to see that they're roughly 85 to 90% in fixed income. So you're going to get the return that you could have gotten had you invested it directly, minus the commissions, expenses, and profits. Um, the economics of term versus disability, you know, both are very important. But if you think about it, if you buy a 30-year term policy, you get the best deal over the last few years of that policy because your likelihood of passing away increases as we age. Disability is just the opposite. Uh, we, we typically buy it when we're younger uh, and it pays out to age 65. So every year that you have it, your potential benefit from it gets less and less. I'll have doctors at 63, sometimes 64 years old, and they're still paying the premium, which has not gone down. And of course, yes, you insure your house, but you don't insure your house for a decline in value. All right, I, I said I had two main pet peeves. Uh, we talked about mortgage, the other are, are munis. And, and by the way, I own some of the Vanguard Intermediate Muni Bond Fund. Um, so I'm not totally against munis, but I'm against putting a whole lot in munis. And I'm absolutely against the way my industry, even Vanguard, I hate to say it, will show the return of a um, muni bond. So the common frame is munis provide a safe tax-free return. During the Great Depression, the loss of muni bonds was only 0.5%. Munis are an inefficient market. Uh, we're, we're buying the bonds themselves use, yields more than twice what you could get on a Vanguard muni bond fund. And, and then a recent portfolio was yielding over 5% federally tax-free. What's wrong with all that? Just about everything. Um, number one, munis, depending upon the type of calculation, whether you want to like assume la la land returns um, of these pensions or more realistic returns, they have about two to six trillion dollars worth of unfunded pension and healthcare liabilities. Most companies got rid of defined benefit plans in favor of. Uh, defined contribution, 401k, 403b type of uh, plans, but not so uh, for, for state and, and local governments. Uh, so munis could have a new correlation to stocks so that if stocks don't do very, very well over the next 10 years, as the baby boomers have retired and those payments are going out, there could be a lot of stress on those munis. It's possible the government bails them out, but that's a lot of money. Um, and then finally, you know, when it comes to, uh, um, you know, looking at the, uh, um, sorry, the, the, the amount of uh, bond, you know, people that have uh, uh, retired, uh, the, there weren't these baby boomers that had retired uh, back during the Great Depression. And then framing the return on principle it should be completely illegal. So here's the way the trick works. And I've actually met with the executive director and all of her senior staff on this who are really nice people. But I think what's going on is just tricking people. So I, I, I buy a bond. I, I sell you a bond. It has a $5 coupon. And, and we buy it for $112 a piece. So the yield is 4.46%. Now this bond is gonna mature or be called in three years at $100. So roughly that $12 divided by the three years, uh, roughly um, $4 of that $5 is just return of your own principal. Your statement is gonna show that as income. Uh, so the actual yield is 0.89%. And of course me as your uh, advisor who's building this bond portfolio, I may charge you 0.5% or 1% of that. So your actual nominal yield may be 
negative. And am I exaggerating? I just looked at a uh, uh, portfolio uh, that had an average coupon of a little over 5%. The yield to worst, which is really the best case scenario, the yield to worst is a calculation of if the bond is called. And why it's a best case scenario is that if interest rates do go up, those bonds aren't going to be called and you're going to be stuck earning a lower than market um, rate. So the manager fee was 0.35%. So the net yield of this client was 0.05%. In addition, spreads can easily be over 1% on a muni. So this, the stocks, there are national markets and such where they trade, but not so in the bond market. And munis can have that 1% spread. The largest spread I've ever seen, which you can't actually see until the bond has closed, the client came to me, had a 10.25% spread on a bond he had bought. And by the way, that client was a very senior attorney with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Had, had no clue this was going on. Uh, what to do with the... Um, expensive bond fund. I'm not going to go through or the expensive dog fund. Uh, you, you have to do a calculation of you know, what the tax consequences are to getting out versus what the tax consequences are to staying in because they may be doing a lot of trading and, and, and the like. Uh, you have to look at what the life expectancy of the person is. You know, will the step up basis still be there? But um, uh, you know, it, it, it's a fairly complex analysis. And usually when I look at a portfolio, it's not a let's get out of everything. Um, it's a uh, uh, what to get out of, what to stay in. And when you have an expensive dog fund, for gosh sakes, don't, don't let dividend reinvestments keep going. You're just buying more of that uh, same fund. Uh, financial advisor, I'm a certified financial planner. You should stick with me because I'm a fiduciary. I'm legally obligated to put your interests ahead of mine. Uh, the CFP board enforces a higher standard. Um, I'm thoroughly vetted and look for advisors who have been publicly recognized. That's the pitch. The reality is the fiduciary standard isn't enforced. It isn't enforced by the SEC, state regulators, and the CFP board. For many years, I've given data to Kevin Keller, who, who is the CEO of the CFP board, showing that the only actions that they take come after that of other clients, uh, uh, other uh, regulators. Um, you, you know, I once helped a client file a complaint on. Uh, uh, you know, a double dipping where, where the CFP with fiduciary duty couldn't make up his mind whether to charge uh, a commission or percentage of assets going on. So he did both. The total fees were 5.29%. CFP board, first they lost the complaint and then they ultimately uh, found no wrongdoing. Um, Jason Zweig, I don't know if you've read some of his columns a couple of years ago, uh, exposing the hypocrisy of people that have had huge CFPs that have had huge uh, um, uh, findings by uh, FINRA and the like, but have completely clean records on the Let's Make a Plan CFP website. And, and some of these prestigious awards I thought were for sale for any person, but it turns out, turns out you, you don't have to be a person. Um, so in my office is a uh, beautiful plaque of one of America's top financial planners and the Consumers Research Council of America's prestigious address is Pennsylvania Avenue on Was in Washington, D.C. Uh, only I got it from my dog, Max Tailwagger. Um, and, um, you know, he also, I sent in an application for him to be one of America's top financial planners for doctors, um, which he was also approved for. And I was too cheap to spend the money on that. I deeply regret that decision. Poor Max, he 
passed away about a month ago. Um, all right, next, uh, Social Security. And by the way, I presented this slide at the White Coat Investor last month with, or, or last March with um, Mike Piper standing just a few feet from me. But he's actually okay with this. Let me explain uh, why I took Social Security at age 62, which Mike Piper and most people would say that was a wrong thing to do, but I only did it in my mind. So mentally, uh, I'm receiving $2,400 a month. And what I'm really doing is buying an inflation adjusted deferred annuity at a 40% discount over what you could have bought it from an insurance company a few years ago, but now the insurance companies aren't even offering that uh, inflation adjusted annuity. Why? Because the actuaries are way too afraid of inflation and there's no way to hedge uh, that. But what I tell clients that it's okay to spend that money if they needed it, take it out of their own portfolio because what they're really doing is buying that inflation adjusted, government protected um, uh, annuity. Um, so the best social security calculator by far comes from that guy that makes me look bad, Mike Piper. Uh, you know, it's absolutely brilliant. Having worked, been an officer for a couple of insurance companies, he doesn't just assume that we're gonna die in a certain year, that a 63 year old male is gonna live, you know, 26 years, whatever. He's, he's doing what an actuary would do, looking at the probabilities of passing away each year. And he gives this away. It, it's just absolutely, um, it's a, it's a brilliant calculator. Tax strategies when you retire. Again, it's ironic that a very young guy, Mike Piper, uh, really is, is the world's leading expert on, on some of this. But there's tax gain harvesting. You can take um, um, capital gains uh, at a 0% tax bracket when your income is low and you're delaying Social Security before the RMD. And that's just tax gain harvesting. And you don't have to wait 31 days, by the way, only for tax, there's a tax loss wash sale, not a tax gain wash sale. Um, partial Roth conversions. Uh, certainly if you're at the, you know, a low tax bracket, I think in general, um, try to use up that 12% marginal federal tax bracket. Um, tax deferred, um, um, withdrawals managing to, to marginal tax rates. Again, that, that 12%. Roth conversions. Um, yes, I invented the Roth. And if anyone believes that, I've got some oceanfront property in Minnesota. Well, you do have 10,000 lakes. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I'm a believer in, in tax diversification. You can never predict what Congress is going to do. That's harder than predicting the market. Um, so a... Um, you know, a Roth conversion for tax diversification, you know, what's the size of your Roth money compared to your tax deferred and taxable money? You know, is the current marginal tax bracket uh, low? Um, the higher your income in retirement, the less attractive it is to do the uh, uh, conversions. The more burdensome of the RMDs, uh, the, the, the greater the argument to, to do a Roth. Um, and then you, you, you really should have some after-tax money to uh, pay the taxes on the conversion. Uh, before 59 and a half, you'd actually be hit up with a penalty if you paid for it with the um, IRA money. Uh, you've got to look at whether your state has a tax exemption. For very uh, wealthy people, there can be some estate tax uh, planning benefits to do the conversion. Now, one of the things I don't have to consider is what we think Congress is gonna do because that's unpredictable in my opinion. Um, financial wealth, you know, the common framing is, is we measure net worth, at least in the US in dollars. So someone with, if I have $10 million and you only have a million dollars, I would be 10 times richer in you than you. And of course, there's no quick way to get rich. And I think all of that is wrong. 
I would measure um, your, your net worth in years. So it's your total net worth divided by how much a year you need to support your life. So who's richer? Um, I, I have $10 million, but I have a very wealthy lifestyle. Uh, I need $5, a year, $5 million a year to support my lifestyle. I've got two years worth of financial freedom. You're only worth a million dollars, but you can be happy with $50,000 a year. You have 20 years worth of financial freedom because we can't take it with us. You're 10 times wealthier than me and probably a hundred times happier, by the way, if I needed $5 million a year to support my lifestyle. Uh, and you really can get rich quickly by cutting down what you're spending. Now, you know, all sorts of frugal strategies are, are out there and, and things like the Starbucks factor, um, not buying as much pop, um, you know, those are things that can, you know, cut down expenditures, but there are, you know, the, the, the gorilla in the room is really the car. And I'm going to brag, I've been driving millionaire cars all my life. Uh, my, my, my last car was a Pontiac uh, Grand uh, Prix that I bought mostly with GM credit card points. My current car is an eight-year-old Chevy Volt getting uh, well over 250 miles per gallon, running mostly on electricity. Um, but, um, you know, I, I pride myself on having the worst car in the neighborhood. The goal is not to look good. The goal of a car, in my opinion, is to be safe and get you from A to B. And my Chevy Volt gets me from A to B, uh, maybe eight seconds less than the Lamborghini. So finally, money and happiness. Um, you know, if you think about it, as Bill Bernstein says, when you've won the game, quit playing. And it doesn't mean get, he doesn't mean get out of stocks completely. He just means take risk off the table. So, you know, if, if somebody is, is close to winning the game, if their money goes up by 70%, they're gonna be marginally happier. If Jeff Bezos makes another billion dollars, I'm sure he'll smile, but it's not gonna change his lifestyle. But losing money um, causes a lot of unhappiness. And you know, we take these risk profile questionnaires, I think they're worse than um, worthless. Um, you know, we've really got to think about, I'm sorry the market didn't perform as we thought, uh, you can't buy that vacation house. You can't send your kids to college, uh, at the expense of college, uh, et cetera. Um, second, uh, greater portfolio. Again, that's the same as, uh, Taylor's three fund portfolio. Uh, the, the aggressive is 90% stocks, uh, moderate 60% stocks and conservative 30% stocks. Uh, they all performed roughly the same over this period. Uh, but yet we as investors, even Bogleheads, by the way, are predictably irrational. And I had several Bogleheads call me up in March of last year. This time really is different. We've never had a pandemic before. One sold millions and millions of dollars of stocks just at the wrong time. So, you know, buy and hold is good, but buy, hold, and rebalance is better. And our human nature is, is probably not likely to um, change significantly going forward. So I'm a believer in setting that asset allocation and sticking with it no matter what, which the book Noise is, is brilliant. Um, and you know, a, a computer generated asset allocation, a robo advisor uh, didn't know the pandemic was going on and did all the right things. So that's what I have for you guys. Wonderful, thank you, Alan. If there's questions, uh, I did see a few came in. Uh, feel free to chat them. We are monitoring the chat. Um, meanwhile, I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit and switch back to Mel. Mel, I call him the first 
Boglehead, but I should probably call him the first or second Boglehead based on who I just saw coming to the, the chat room here. So Mel, can you give us some uh, history lessons on the diehards, how that came into being, the move to Bogleheads? Uh, how did how did we get 100 people here from across the country all, all calling yourself Bogleheads? Uh, oh, you're muted, Mel. I don't know if Diane, if you could unmute him. Actually, I uh, I'm not sure who created the uh, the phrase "bogo heads," but initially it was a derogatory term. Hmm. Other, really? Yeah, there was no uh, diehard or bogo head forum uh, Morningstar initially back in 1998, and uh, the uh, Posters, the Bogleheads who were posting were considered uh, uh, outlaws or bad guys or whatever from the other people who were trying to figure out all the ways to beat the market and uh, so forth. So uh, the Bogleheads were asking for their own forum and Morningstar uh, finally relented and created, but they were afraid to use the term Bogleheads and to call us Bogleheads because it was used as a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. So instead they called us the Vanguard diehards, diehards because we wouldn't give up asking for our own forum. And they uh, created, they put a subtitle on the forum, which was Bogleheads Unite, talk about your fa favorite fan, uh, your favorite fun company. So that was their way of calling us Bogleheads, but not making it really a Bogleheads forum. So it was called the Vanguard Diehards uh, because of that. And it stayed that way all the time that we were uh, on Morningstar. They were definitely afraid that Jack would be upset by the term Bogleheads too, because again, it was used as a derogatory term. And Jack and other, morning, uh, other Vanguard people used to monitor uh, monitor our form from time to time. So they knew Jack would see them. So therefore that's how we became the Vanguard Diehards. Huh. Okay. When was that? Was that about 98, 97, do you remember? 1998, uh, what was that, 20, 20 something years ago? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 23 years ago, well. So uh, then the move to bogleheads.org happened probably right around the early 2000s? 2007. Okay. And again, that was a, a real fluke. Uh, Morningstar, Morningstar's uh, uh, software was really out of date and uh, we kept asking for them to, to uh, update the forum software. And they kept saying they were going to do it, uh, but they never did, they just dragged their feet. So I, one of the Bogleheads, as a joke, set up, Bogleheads. Well, the forum, what's now Bogleheads.org, set it up as a joke to show Morningstar, this isn't rocket science. I can do it for nothing in five minutes. So he set up this dummy forum and all of a sudden a, a couple of Bogleheads found it. And they started posting. They said, hey, there's a new Bogleheads forum. So now I went over and I took a look at it and I went, oh my God, this is, this is our future because we control this thing now and we're not uh, beholden to Morningstar, even though Morningstar was very good to us. I don't mean to downgrade that, but uh, the guy who set it up, set it up as a joke and he was going to throw, he was just going to kill it. He just wanted to do this to show Morningstar what could be done. And I said, no, don't, don't let it go. We need to hang on to this. So he didn't want to host it. And I had no way of hosting it. Uh, that's not my uh, uh, lane. So I got a hold of Alex and uh, Larry to see about hosting this. And that's how, that's how we took it over. And then I was member number seven. Hmm. And then the word got out on the Morningstar forum, hey, Mel's over there. So a number of people who thought that this gave it legitimacy started coming over. But Taylor, who I understand is on, is on uh, this uh, now, Taylor was reluctant to join. 
because he felt a, an allegiance to Joe Mansquito, the chairman of uh, Morningstar, who had been very good to us. And so did I, really. So I kept trying to get Taylor to come over. He wouldn't come over. Finally, I said, Taylor, well, make a deal with you. You and I, out of respect and for Joe, will continue to post on both forums. So Taylor agreed, and uh, that was our deal. Taylor came over. And of course, then the floodgates, because now it was totally legitimate, the floodgates. And for a number of, of uh, I, don't, I don't remember how long it was, but for a while, uh, Alex and uh, Larry put up a, a split screen, which showed posts on the Morningstar forum on the one side and posts on the Diehards forum on the other side. So people could go there and choose where they wanted to, um, which uh, threads they wanted to, to see. But what happened is after a while, there was nothing on the morning store side and there, everything was on the uh, Bowhead side. So we stopped that. And uh, uh, that's basically how the forum got started. It started as a joke. Hmm. Fortunately, I realized that this was our future and uh, uh, obviously that's the case now. Uh, the number of uh, posts we get, the number of hits we get, the num number of members we have are all just through the roof. So. Uh, it's been uh, it's it's been quite a ride, and uh, Taylor and I are still posting on there. Did you have in your wildest dreams the idea that you go from that fake almost protest forum back in two thousand two to what it is right now? I mean, when did it dawn on you that this thing is uh, out of control in a great way? When did that dawn on you? It, it and it still is. Uh, for instance, it was uh, maybe a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago, I just opened the, the latest chapter in Germany. Uh, we have something like 90 chapters now, 10 of which are, I think about 10 are uh, in foreign countries. Uh, it's just, it's just uh, mind blowing when you consider that we were just a, a few guys on Morningstar trying to help other investors. And now we have this worldwide organization. We have, uh, best-selling books. Uh, we have uh, national conferences. Uh, and of course, being connected to Jack Bogle was really the key to our success. Uh, I mean, how many people have written books and can't get anybody to even look at them? And here we have a publisher calling and asking us to write books. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I hung up on them a number of times. Uh, I thought it was a hoax because <laughs> I know that publishers just don't call you and ask you to write a book when you're an unknown. But uh, uh, yeah, so it was uh, uh, writing the book and then having it come out and then becoming one of the top 10 uh, books selected by Amazon for 2006. Of course, all of that stuff just gave us more publicity. Uh, when we had our first conference in Miami, uh, there's a backstory to this, which I'd like to share. Uh, the Taylor, Taylor and I, I made a post in 2000 uh, or 1999, I guess it was at Thanksgiving saying, happy Thanksgiving. Here's what I'm thankful for. And then everybody was chiming in and Taylor chimed in and said, I'm thankful for my wife and my kids and all that, but I'm thankful to Jack Bogle also thankful to Jack Bogle because I live in the house that Jack built. Well, again, as I said, Jack monitored our, watched our forum from time to time and he saw that. And he sent a handwritten note to us asking if there was any interest in getting together with him at a non-resort place. Well, for us, that was like getting an invitation to audience with the Pope or an invitation to the White House. So Taylor and I tried to figure out how we were going to pull this off. And I was a snowbird at that time. I spent the winters in Florida. Taylor knew that. And Jack was going to be the keynote speaker at the Miami Herald Making Money Seminar. So Taylor said, hey, Mel, why don't we use this as an opportunity to try to get together with Jack? So I said, well, that's great. We'll do that. So I got in touch with the Miami Herald people and I asked them if uh, they could give us a, a room somewhere where we could get together with Jack for an hour or two for lunch. And they shoot us away like a bunch of groupies, which actually we were. And uh, 
They said, no, we've got Jack all tied up. We don't have time. So uh, you'll have to uh, just go about your business. So anyway, I called Jack and said, hey, they said, we can't get together. And he said, well, hey, I'll go wherever you want me. So now uh, we made a post. We only had about 20 something people because it was very short notice. So we decided to hold it at Taylor's 35th floor condo overlooking Biscayne Bay. And uh, we hired a chef and a, uh, uh, a maid and uh, had this uh, nice thing with Jack. But in the meantime, the, the Miami Herald got word that uh, we're having this event with Jack and they, don't, they want to cover it. So they come hat in hand and said, Mel, can we send a photographer, a reporter and a photographer? Well, instead of being jerks like they were to us, we said, sure. So they send the, the photographer and the reporter and we ended up with a front page story in the business section of Miami Herald carried over into the in, inside. So all of these things just gave us a little more publicity and we became a little better known. The next year, Jason Zweig, who's now with uh, Wall Street Journal was with Money, Money Magazine then. Jason uh, wanted to come and cover our conference and uh, bring a photographer. So we ended up with a six, eight page spread in Money Magazine with all kinds of photos and that. So again, here uh, more exposure. And then the book, and it just continued to build and it still continues to this day. So yeah, it's, it's just... Uh, Mind blowing when you think of where we started and where it is now. No, it's amazing. Just this morning, I did some metrics here, and then just said me 703 people were online when I looked right before the meeting here. There's been 5,941,000 posts since that forum was created, and there's 109,000 members that have actually registered. You know, it probably gets 10 times the amount of traffic of people that don't register. So there's probably over a million people, I'm sure, have hit that page in the last year. So that, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And uh, when anytime I can see the back numbers, and anytime you see 700 uh, uh, people online, uh, any, for members, there's usually about 10 guests for each member that's online. Yeah. Uh, because they can read, people can read anytime they want. They don't have to sign up. You only sign up if you want to uh, uh, make a post. So there are uh, more and more visitors and they're from all around the world, which is amazing too. You know, personally, I used to have to look for like, what's the expense ratio of ETI Boglehead? And I put that on there. Now I don't have to put Boglehead. When I look at my Google results, <laughs> one of the top five links are going to Boglehead Wiki or somewhere. It's just awesome. Yeah, it's been, uh, a, it's been an amazing ride and to have all those conferences. We thought, Taylor and I thought that the, uh, to get together with Jack in Miami was going to be a one time off. And then everybody's asking on the forum, when's the next one? When's the next one? Like, oh my God, we, we won't even. <laughs> That's here you are 20 years later. Well, let me ask you a question. When is the next one? Well, uh, this year is not going to be an in person, it'll probably be virtual. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to say in the beginning, I am no longer. Uh, running the conferences. I'm not on the team anymore. Uh, but from what I understand, it's going to be virtual this year. Next year will be a conference. And, you know, initially we moved the conferences all around the country. But then when Jack's health started deteriorating, we stayed in Philly. There's no reason uh, to stay in Philly now because of, uh, because Jack is no longer with us. So uh, it's probably going to be moved around the country again. It's probably going to be a lot longer. There's a different team running uh, the uh, operation. And uh, I think their goal is, or, or their idea is to have this big deal. Uh, I tried to purposely keep it smaller so that it would be intimate and people could talk to Jack and Bill Bernstein and Rick and the other people who were there. Uh, so uh, now uh, I don't know where it's going to be, but. Uh, uh, we'll have to see uh, when they finally figure it out because they want it to be somewhere where people can connect direct flight without having to uh, go through uh, a number of transfers and so forth. So that's all in the uh, in the works and I really am not privy to what's going on other than I know it's going to be a big one and uh, in 2022. 
No, that sounds great. Thanks for that, that update. And Can I just pipe in? Yeah, the goal is a uh, uh, October 2022 larger conference uh, at a location yet to be determined. Good to know. Um, getting back to books, Mel. Uh, so there's been three successful books. Is there any, are they keep calling? Is there going to be a fourth in the series? Do you know anything about that? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that our publisher is Wally and Wally publishes the dummies books, as you know, the dummies. Well, the dummies books, each one is written by a specialist in the topic, but Wally figured that the Bogleheads was going to be a series like the dummies books. And of course, there are only a few of us writing these things. So it takes uh, nine months to a year to write a book. And it's... Uh, uh, by the way, if you see what Taylor's doing, I think he's holding up a Boglehead book in Chinese. Well, we do. our books have been converted. And I had boxes of books show up on my, uh, on my doorstep. And I had no idea what they were. But I thought they, somebody got the wrong shipment here. And it turns out it was... a one of our versions, we have uh, several versions in Chinese. And, uh, uh, but uh, yes, uh, uh, Taylor's book will probably end up, uh, the, the latest book, the Three Fund Portfolio will probably end up in Chinese because our other books have. Uh, yeah. But over the course, over time, I've been, I've been kind of busy. Uh, I, I worked with Taylor on his book, but it was Taylor's book, uh, that's his baby. I also work with uh, a couple of Boglehead doctors who uh, have a new book coming out. It should be out any day now. Uh, and uh, it's specifically geared towards doctors and, uh, and the financing. So I've been busy with that. I've been busy with a lot of this stuff, but I keep, uh, I keep feeling that any day we're gonna get that call from Wally saying, hey, how about another book? Yeah. Or, or, or else uh, uh, asking us to update, go to the third edition. And I called Michael ahead of time to ask him, Michael, are you going to be up to another book? Because I got a feeling I'm going to get a call. So sure enough, a day after I talked to Michael, I get a call from Wally. And they said, Mel, uh, Barnes & Noble has got this huge, wants this huge order of your book but they want a uh, paperback version. And uh, we don't have a paperback version of the second edition. So uh, he said, Mel, we need, we need something uh, for the cover. And I said, well, you've got, you've got Jack Bogle wrote the, the, uh, uh, the forward. So just pull something out of there and put it on the cover. One of Jack's pithy sayings, you know, the Bogleheads, uh, whatever. And uh, so we do have a, paperback coming out and it'll be available on, uh, at some point at Barnes and Noble. But I, I really, uh, you know, I have a political career now. I got elected in 2016 as a city council member, 2018 got reelected and then 2020 I became vice mayor. So I'm helping run a city, uh, helping other people with their books, doing work on the forum. I am pretty busy and I, I just don't know whether I have time for another book. Well, no, talking about busy, that sounds incredibly busy. Uh, before we pivot back to Alan Mill, uh, you knew Jack really well. Is there one thing you could tell us about him that maybe a lot of people don't know about him? Well, I don't know that everyone knows that Jack had a, uh, a heart replacement. And because of the heart replacement, he had to take drugs to keep the anti-rejection drugs, but the anti-rejection drugs cause uh, all kinds of things that uh, are minor to you and me turn into major deals when you get, uh, when he would get an infection. Jack used to end up in uh, the hospital a lot. And of course our planning was nine months long for the conferences. And Jack was the, uh, of course, the, the focal point well, I would get calls. I got calls a number of times in uh, in the summer saying Jack is in the hospital and we don't think he's going to be able to make the conference and he's not, you know, things aren't good. So I had, an, uh, we, we had a number of scares over the years with Jack's health. And uh, the, 
uh, Jack had attended, despite being in the hospital, he would get out and he would get better and he would make the conferences. But it was real close to our Dallas-Fort Worth conference when I got the call that Jack is not going to be able to make it. So we had to go to plan B and uh, create, create a different uh, agenda and get different speakers and so forth, which we did. But at the conference, uh, Kevin, who was Jack's assistant said, Jack wants to call on your cell phone from the hospital and he wants you to hold your uh, phone up to the microphone and speak to the, uh, the Bogo heads. So I said, well, that's gonna get squeals and everything else. So I quickly got a phone line and put in the hotel in the conference room, had it wired to the speakers in the conference room. And sure enough, Jack calls at the appointed time and proceeded to speak to his bogleheads. Hmm. And there wasn't a dry eye in the place. And we were trying to figure out how Jack even got a cell phone in intensive care. But anyway, uh, so since Jack uh, uh, spoke to us over the phone, we considered that his uh, attendance and not break his perfect attendance record. So Jack's attendance record is still intact because of that speaking to the Bogoheads over from the hospital. So he loved his Bogoheads. They meant so much to him. And uh, of course he did to us too. So uh, he was really special. Yeah. Well, those are great stories. Thanks so much for that, Mel. And now, I don't know how to awkwardly pivot away from that, those great stories back to finances, but I'm just going to plunge into some of these questions. So for Alan or, or Mel, feel free to jump in here too. Um, bond portion of the portfolio, uh, should it be total bond market or is it short-term bonds based on today's environment or a mix? And if it's a mix, what ratio is the question that came in? You want me to take that? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, Alan, if you could take that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, you know, total bond is my core bond fund. I also use some direct CDs that have easy early withdrawal penalty. Um, but all of my fixed income is high credit quality. Uh, the thing about a short-term bond is it's kind of like cash. You're, you're guaranteed to underperform, you know, the, the inflation and, 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 you know, lose spending power. So in general, I believe in an intermediate bond fund, especially because our yield curve is positively sloped right now. Uh, I don't have the guts to go long-term. Um, and, and then short-term, like I said, it, it's practically guaranteed to underperform and, and, and you're better off doing something like a, uh, you know, there's several savings accounts, FDIC or NCUA insured paying between 0.5 and 0.85. So I would argue, you know, that's better than a, a Vanguard short-term bond index fund, which I'm guessing is paying somewhere around 0.45, 0 0.5% and has some risk. Well, I would, I agree with Alan on the uh, investment grade. I think that uh, duration has to be considered. Uh, so for most people, the uh, intermediate is gonna work, but for short-term needs, uh, I like uh, short-term investment grade bond at, at uh, Vanguard. But one thing that isn't mentioned, uh, and Alan touched on inflation, and one way right now to, or one way is uh, I bonds. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a place for I, uh, in most portfolios for I bonds. Uh, the, there is the purchase limit of 10,000 per person per year, but uh, you can get one for the husband, one for the wife, you can get 5,000 back in your tax return. And if you have trust, you can also get another 10,000. So it, it doesn't take long to accumulate uh, a, a fair amount of inflation protection with the uh, I bonds. Hmm. I've been hearing you hawk the I bonds for about 20 years now, I think now, They're, they never go out of flavor. Yeah, well, the, the, the thing is, is that the people who backed up the uh, truck when I uh, suggested they do are sitting on those 3033, 34, 36 uh, real yield bonds that are paying 7% now. Uh, they, are, they are sitting uh, looking oh, for That's amazing in today's low interest environment for the people that took your advice, I guess, back in the day. Um, 
shifting to uh, capital gains tax, it's been possibly doubling for high earners at some future point. And if, if that's an eventuality, is there anything we could be doing now to prepare for a higher capital gains in the future? For either Alan or uh, Mel. <laughs> Mel, do you want to take it? I'm, I'm happy to take it. Uh... Take less money. You know, the, the only thing harder than, I'm sorry, go ahead, Alan. The only thing harder than predicting the market is predicting what politicians will do. Yeah, in so, fact, we don't even allow uh, discussions of proposed <laughs> regulations on the forum simply because people might make a bad decision based on something that may never happen. So you have to, you have to go with the, the law the way it is. To the current Biden proposal, um, it is for those with over a million dollars of income. And the current Biden proposal has it retroactive to April 28th. <laughs> now, again, I don't predict, you know, everything in that proposal I think is unlikely to go through, especially in our current political climate. But I mean, if that were going to happen, and if you were going to sell it while you were alive, then yes, you would want a tax gain harvest. But I think that would be an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Um, so what, what I'm telling clients is, is do nothing right now. Okay, good. Uh, follow up to that with inflation starting to perk up. There's a question around any proposed changes to the portfolios. Is now a time to get more into tips if you haven't been historically or with inflation perking up? What, what do you recommend for changes to the asset allocation? Mel, do you want me to take it? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, absolutely nothing. Inflation has perked up. Um, I, I think I mentioned that I, along with the top economists in the world, have a, a horrible track record of predicting interest rates, and those interest rates are tied to inflation. Um, so certainly we have had some you know, greater inflation in the last few months, whether or not it will continue the bond market is actually saying, we don't think so. Um, you know, the way I learned economics is, is that more money chasing the same amount of goods and services causes a lot of inflation. But Japan has been printing more money than we have for, for decades and fighting deflation. So I would resist the urge to try to predict inflation. The I bonds are certainly better than the tips. I think I looked at the, uh, the, the Vanguard intermediate tips fund, it had a negative yield of something like 1.65%, meaning that if we had 2% inflation, then that's going to yield 0.35%. So CDs that have easy early withdrawal penalties, um, I bonds, you know, to the extent that it can be a material part of your portfolio, you know, I think are ways to go. And, and, and again, that's why I wouldn't go long term on a bond fund, a uh, long duration. Yeah, I think I think Alan touched on the thing that's important to me and should be important to other investors is that it, at the current time, uh, tips uh, are not attractive to me simply because they have the negative yield. You're guaranteed to get less money back than you than you put in. Uh, so at this point, uh, I think the first 10, 20, 30, 35,000, whatever that you can afford to buy in I-bond uh, or the place to go for inflation protection now okay. and with the, even with the current ones that they are selling with the zero uh, fixed rate you're still getting 3.54 percent uh, which is nothing to sneeze at uh, it's probably the most attractive rate that's out there that's risk-free so uh, my first 10 20 or 30 thousand would be in uh, in, in bonds. okay good to know and I I hesitate to ask this question with a room full of bullets because I think I know the answer that someone had suggested or asked. What do you think of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, et cetera? Do they have a place in mass allocation? Yeah, in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I own a little bit of Bitcoin, but only because I had to write about it and I wanted to actually make sure that what I was being told on how you buy it works. And, you know, Bitcoin... I'm not convinced it's going to be worth zero. I, I think the odds are it'll be worth 
zero, but it does disintermediate the financial services industry and, and solve something. Dogecoin, like the Bogleheads, was started as a joke, and it just absolutely amazes me that it has significant value. I, I don't think it's going to be as successful as, as Mel and Taylor, what you guys created with the Bogleheads. Well, I, I have a, a question for somebody who uh, might have an answer. How do you buy or sell something, not, not the coin itself, but with the coin, when the value is changing dramatically every day, every hour. So you, you have something for sale for 10,000 and somebody is gonna give you 10,000 uh, in Bitcoin and five minutes later, it's worth 8,000. Uh, how do you set a price either as a buyer or a seller when the, the uh, value is constantly changing? Uh, that that's the question I would ask. Uh, for something to be effective, you have to have stability. And right now, you have no stability. And I don't know if you're ever going to have it. Yeah. Another question came in. I think based on a slide from your talk, Alan, would be: Can you please explain why dividend stocks would not be a good investment? Well, dividends are, are value stocks, and they may outperform, they may underperform, they have grossly underperformed. I mean, there are certain really safe dividend stocks like Eastman Kodak, uh, General Motors, uh, more recently GE, that are just blue chips that are going to pay forever. And, and that's just not true. And if you think of dividends, they're, they're very tax inefficient because you would rather uh, you know, not pay, pay less taxes on the dividends. So I'm not totally against dividend stocks. I, in fact, you know, I believe in value. I believe in growth. I believe in large cap, mid cap, small cap. Um, you know, the diversified portfolio is, is guaranteed to beat most investors. And, and you're far better off, by the way, controlling when you want to recognize the gains by by selling the long-term capital gains that, than the dividends. So I, I'm against a dividend tilted portfolio. I, I believe in everything. Um, Taylor's three fund portfolio is all you need. That's a question from down uh, below. And I think this question was asked not knowing Taylor would be here. So people are asking if you're a fan of your the two fund portfolio from Jack Bogle, I think it was. Is it VT everything and then total bond in the US or the three fund from Taylor or the four fund uh, portfolio from Rick Ferry? I guess, uh, are you a fan of that? Was it uh, of either the two fund, the three fund or the four fund was a question out there. And I think you already gave your answer, Alan. You said the three fund, but is there a space or, or one, one might you consider a two fund or a four fund? Well, you know, what can have a, a single fund, a, a target date? Uh, portfolio or, um, you know, a fund of funds, you know, that Vanguard offers and the like. And Jack, let's face it, I've been wrong. Jack Bogle has been right on, on international continuing to underperform. Yeah. Well, that, uh, again, oh, go ahead, no. There's a, uh, a very long uh, thread going right now on the argument, uh, either the uh, international yes or no. And there are, uh, I mean, it's really contentious. Uh, the people are really dug in one way or the other. And it's, it might be interesting to follow because there are a lot of good uh, thoughts on both sides. So there's no necessarily, not necessarily a right or wrong. There's what's, what's right for you. And one of the things that I posted on that thread was that I think that it's whatever you're comfortable with. If you are gonna not be a buy and holder when, uh, uh, international goes down, uh, it tanks, then uh, you don't believe in it, uh, that, that's your choice. I, I, do, uh, I do believe that uh, uh, Jack was right and has been proven right. Uh, personally, uh, I think that for people who are a little queasy but that do want international, I think that what Alan touched on, a, a life strategy or a uh, uh, a target date fund might be appropriate because one of the advantages of those is that you don't see the different element going down within that portfolio. You just look at the 
the hole. And if the hole's doing okay, you're going to hang in there, even though, <clears throat> excuse me, even though it's the U.S. that's uh, doing great and international's not doing so good, your portfolio is still doing okay. So I think that that's a good a good reason to hold for certain investors a life strategy or a, a target date fund. And it harnesses the power of inertia automatically, yeah. rebalances for you. And when it comes to you know international, yes or no. My belief is that it's more important to be consistent. Back in 2007, when international had tripled, when U.S. stocks had only doubled, you know, I saw a lot of portfolios very heavily invested in international. Now I'm seeing portfolios very light in international, and performance chasing, you know, is is alive and well, and and we need to be consistent. Uh, I, I typically go for a third, and and there's some comfort being, you know, somewhere between. Um, Vanguard's 40% and Jack Bogle's uh, 0%. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. There's a question here from Adele Alamadi uh, from Bahrain. So that's why I love this Zoom stuff. I don't think uh, he'd be coming from Bahrain to Minnesota uh, to uh, visit us in person, but here we can communicate in Zoom. And he had asked around, doesn't a small cap value diversify <laughs> because the total stock market is so, like you said, uh, growth and large cap dominating now. And, and there's another question I'll combine with this around the FAMA French three model tilting to small cap and value, just not, not even when you're in a overweighted large cap growth environment. What do you think about tilting for diversification? Whenever you pick parts of the market, you are not diversifying. You're doing the opposite of diversifying. You are speculating. I believe in the FAMA French three factor model, which says that it's compensation for taking on more risk, that it's not a free lunch. Um, so, you know, I, I choose to do an overall portfolio, which is far more tax efficient, far lower in fees. Um, so I, I certainly believe that in the very long run, certainly almost it's impossible for small cap value to underperform as much as it has in the last five or 10 years. And I do think, you know, the odds are it's going to do better, but it's going to be a whole lot more volatile. And if you think about it, if things go wrong in our economy, it's smaller companies and value companies that are weaker and the plunge could be a whole lot worse. Have I ever mentioned the Taylor Larimore three fund portfolio is what I recommend? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'd just like to let Jeff and everyone know that uh, the last questioner from Bahrain was probably from uh, the, one of the uh, latest chapters that we opened up. But we do have a uh, Boaz local chapter in Bahrain now. Yeah. Wow. That's so great. Such a small world. Here's kind of a nice standalone question for, for someone. What's your recommended safe withdrawal rate for a 65-year-old who just retired in today's environment? I, to me, to me, anything below, anything above two percent might be uh, speculative. But it, uh, so much depends on your family history, your life expectancy, based on your own medical conditions and everything else. Uh, I think that two uh, percent you could live forever. Three percent might be okay. Uh, I think you have to look at. Uh, uh, the market valuations now, it's very high. There, we, we're overdue for a correction. Whether we'll get it or not is, uh, uh, when we'll get it is a question, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is obviously an unknown. But if somebody wanted to be safe in the early years, I would say 2% is about as safe as you can get. 3% uh, uh, might work for you. 4% might work for you if you've got a shorter life expectancy. Uh, that's everything is everything is a guess at this point because you know it would be really great if we knew how long we were going to live but then we would probably have a heart attack <laughs> that's right uh, i'd say start at a three percent um if and only if you're an incredibly low cost disciplined investor and then there are things that you can do such as uh, and, and David Blanchett, who just left Morningstar, has done some brilliant uh, work on this. If you can kind of carve out 
um, what, what are discretionary and non-discretionary, what you would cut if the market doesn't perform well, and then how much of your income is guaranteed, either through social security or pensions, that those can then adjust from that 3% what you could safely spend. I'm not a believer in um, you know, if the market doesn't do well, you don't increase your expenditure because then over time you're cutting your lifestyle. Okay, good. Shifting gears here a little bit, um, there's some discussion on the chat around global bonds. And I know Vanguard, I think, introduced a global or uh, international bond fund and they're putting it in, I think, some of their target retirement funds. Maybe maybe I'm, I'm speaking out of context here, but yeah. what do you think about global or international bonds? And is there a spot for that uh, in, a, in a U.S. Uh, asset allocation? I'll let Alan take that because no, I don't like them. Yeah, I, I was lobbied very heavily when Vanguard came out with it to write about it, and I did write about it, but I kind of gave it a ho hum mm -hmm. sort of, you know, recommendation. And and you know, their argument is good that if you look at U.S. stocks, international stocks, U.S. bonds, international bonds, the largest part of the pie is international bonds. But international bonds are more expensive. I agree with Vanguard's hedging of them. And if you look at the purpose of the bond portfolio, it, it's it's the shock absorber, the stable value, the, you know, what you're gonna have to live on. And let's face it, and most of my bonds, the vast majority are backed by the US government. And if the US government goes out of business and the portfolio is gonna fail. So I don't see an incredible need to buy the international bond. If you're gonna buy it, I would buy the Vanguard total international bond fund. And if clients wanna have them, I'm happy to let them keep it. What would be the top percentage of your bonds you'd recommend in international bonds if you decide to go that way? You know, I've never been asked that question, so I'm going to, uh, on the fly, say I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't go more than 10% of a, a bond portfolio. Okay. And again, it's, it's high credit quality and it's hedged. So it's not a bad thing, but the, the, the fees are just a bit higher. Okay. I think one of the other the important things too is for investors should understand what they're buying, and I don't think that they would necessarily understand uh, international bonds. So, I just am not a fan of them. Got it. Okay, this one came in specifically for Alan. Uh, can you give us some examples of lower hanging fruit mentioned in his articles? Recommendations for the current environment. Well, you know, like I mentioned, I'm earning 1% on my cash versus leaving it at a Vanguard or Fidelity at 0.01%. Uh, there are other things like if you have access to that TIAA traditional with a 3% guarantee or the G fund, um, if you're in, you know, the only thing that, that makes less sense than an expensive active fund is an expensive index fund. Uh, which is guaranteed to underperform. But low hanging fruit is something that I are paying down the mortgage, getting that two and a half percent return. Those are, you know, I define low hanging fruit as increasing your return without increasing any risk. So in other words, you're guaranteed, virtually guaranteed to do better with low hanging fruit. Don't go with Mercedes Benz financing, you know, paying 2%. On your cash because it's not even backed by Mercedes Benz, much less a government. Don't get greedy on those things. Those aren't low hanging fruit. The um, master limited partnerships, all those things that were just safe. It's like a toll road. You know, the oil has to flow through it, um, et cetera. Th those are not low hanging fruit. Those are taking on a great amount of risk. Okay, great. Someone had asked if you have your own website and Lady Geek posted to the wiki on your name and also dare to be dull.com is where you can see Alan's uh, uh, blog post and so on. The last question, because we're coming up on our time limit here, and it's going to be a little, maybe a strange question, but why not end with a strange question? What have you learned? And this is, I think I'd like both of you to answer if you could. What have you learned in your life outside of personal finance that most helps you with personal finance? That's a good one. <laughs> Without any warning, just throw that out there for you guys. I think for me, I, I learned my lesson in finance very, very early. And, and my parents had gone through the depression and uh, they didn't trust banks. So I saw the, the bank, the Lindar bank at home. 
And I saw my mother budgeting. Of course, my father worked very hard. My mother was a homekeeper. But uh, she had an envelope for every expense. And that was the budget. So when dad cashed his check, he would give her the money and she would put so much in the envelope for food, so much for uh, the electricity, so much for the house and so forth. So I saw that managing your money uh, uh, and, you know, if you, if you got to an envelope, you didn't have any money left, uh, you, you had to readjust uh, the stuff that you had already put in the previous envelopes. So I learned that it, it was very important to uh, manage your money and even when you didn't have a lot of it. And uh, also I learned that you have to save up for things that you want and uh, instead of uh, using credit. Uh, when I, I was in the Marine Corps, I came home at 18 to buy a car and my dad had to co-sign for me and he had no credit uh, because they had paid cash all his life. So uh, I learned that when you want something, you save for it, you work for it. So to me, that was, uh, that was a very important lesson that I learned. And live below your means. I think it's lesson number one. That's great. Thanks for that. That's all good advice. You should, you should write a book or something, though. <laughs> I, I was kidding. Uh, I said you should write a book with all that advice, and then I'm like, oh, you oh. have. Yeah. Uh, any, any last shots on your side, Alan? Yeah, you know, I would say, like every boglehead, you know, I was born wired to be frugal. Um, and, you know, buying things on sale was a good thing. And, uh, you know, when it comes to investing, <laughs> Uh, those low fees and the rebalancing buying after a market plunge, which I will admit was hard as heck for me to do last March or every time I have to do that. But yeah, it, it's those simple things that, you know, being frugal, uh, buying things on sale, you know, it works in investing as well. It's not exciting, but, but it just works. Yep. Agree percent yeah. Alan. That's great. Um, I just want to kind of wrap this up and, and thank Taylor for popping in there. We're honored with your presence, Taylor. It's great to uh, to see you. Uh, we'll see see you on the on the forum and Mel and Alan specifically. Thanks for your time and energy to this. This has been an awesome Minnesota Boglehead meeting. We're thrilled that you took the time out of a nice weekend to join us. And uh, it is recorded. Diana thinks hovering over the end recording and then the magic she does. And I think we have a. a Zinger at the beginning now and the end for these fancy videos and we'll get them online somehow and back out to people. So stay tuned for a, a wrap up with that. And Thanks, with that, Jeff. Thanks, we'll... Diane, for doing all this. And Taylor, thank you for being here. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, Alan, I'm honored to be here. Awesome. On that, uh, well said. We will see you next time.